the signal, so you don't have to mess with that. I have not seen her, I don't think. And Karen always, she's the old college of try. Do you have a pen on you? I'm just going to write down. We seem to have a shortage of pens. I'll find one up there. Oh, here's one. Thanks, Jan. Thank you, Jan. Good morning. I am caught. Good morning.
Good morning, Messiah. Good morning. And a to Holly Hebemeyer, who is at the organ bench. Maybe I'm not sure. Is here in place of Barb, who is doing something <laughs> important. But I'm glad that Holly is here to fill in for her. We're grateful to have you. In our announcements today, as you well know, immediately after this worship service, the congregation will stay in this room. You can just stay in the same seat. Our president, Greg Suskovic, will convene the meeting, and it is a meeting to call a pastor. So this is a very big day. For literally a year, we have been working toward this day, and I'm so glad that you are here to be part of it. It's an important day in the history of our congregation. Secondly, the vaccination time that was put off from today to next Sunday is going to be next Sunday, the 13th. And so if you are looking to get vaccinations, that's the time to do it. Crossroad Campus Ministry has some volunteer needs. Tuesday, October 15th, lunch for a buck. You can see Sarah Suskovic, and she was sitting back at that table, the Messiah Food Ministry to help with that, and also the meal will be made on Monday, the 14th of October at 10 a.m. to do well. Thank you, Sarah, for leading that. Last but not least, our keyboardist and music director for the 10 o'clock, 10.30 service extraordinaire is having a birthday today. Can we? <laughs> May we sing happy birthday to Cindy. Oh, okay. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Cindy. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. We're so excited you're spending of your day of birth with all of us. We begin this morning with our gathering hymn. It is All Are Welcome, 641 in the Red Hymnal. Will you please rise to worship our God?
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. With you. Let us pray. Sovereign, you have created us to live in loving community with one another. Form us for life that is faithful and steadfast, and teach us to trust like little children that we may reflect the image of your Son, Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the children of the parish forward for the children's sermon. Good morning. So glad that you are here today. We have these new Bible story books. Yeah, that's what I said. (laughs) Feel how heavy that is. That's a lot of stories. You want to feel, Timothy, how many pounds? Fifteen pounds of Bible. That's a lot. Well, I thought that this children's Bible did such a great job of... um, explaining today's text, I thought it would be fun if I just read this story to you. Yeah. Hmm. Start upside down. What? Start upside down. Oh, no wonder I couldn't read the words. Oh, now I am. Thank you. Thank you, all of you who notice that. Jesus blesses 
children. So this is this is about you, isn't it? Because you're all children. The disciples were trying to listen to Jesus, but they couldn't hear him. There were so many children laughing and talking. Children sometimes do that, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Some children were small, some tall, some walking, some crawling. Children were everywhere. Jesus, one parent, cried out, please bless my child. My daughter is sick, said another. Lay your hands on her. Please heal her. Well, the disciples, they pushed closer to Jesus and they shouted at the parents. Take your children away. Jesus is trying to teach adults. He's too busy to talk to children. Stop. Stop, Jesus commanded. The disciples stopped shouting. The parents stopped calling out to Jesus. The children, they even stopped laughing and talking. Everyone turned to look at Jesus. You're going to like what he says. Yeah. Let the children come to me. Do not stop them. Isn't that nice? Every adult was thinking, get the kids out of here. But Jesus said, do not stop them. Let them come. So the children rushed to Jesus' side. A little girl crawled up into his lap. A little boy jumped up on his back. Other kids grabbed his hands. And Jesus smiled. Jesus spoke to the crowd. Children are important to God. In God's kingdom, it's better to be like a kid. God's kingdom is about loving and children love and share with all people. You can learn from a child how to be part of God's kingdom. Then Jesus laid his hands on the children, hugged them, and blessed them. Isn't that a nice story? Do you think that you're important to Jesus? Yeah, yeah I do too. If nothing else, because of this story, but a lot of other reasons, you're baptized. You come to church and say hi to him every week. You are getting ready, some of you, to have First Holy Communion. Jesus is very aware of who you are and very, very much happy to welcome you. Unlike the disciples who thought that the kids were annoying Jesus, they certainly were annoying the disciples. But just like I had my Bible turned upside down at the beginning of today's children's sermon, their thinking was turned upside down. They thought, kids don't belong. And Jesus said, yes, they do, because I love them. This is another great story that we learn from the Bible. And Cindy's going to lead us in a song.
pastors are waiting. We'll see you a little bit later. Thanks for coming up. Good morning, friends. Uh, Kim Hendrickson here. It's been my pleasure to be part of your church council for the last two and a half years. I'm now serving as past president. And the key word is serving and service. Our pastor talked to us the other day about uh, the greatest calling is to serve others and to serve God. And so as we move towards 2025, we're going to be looking for people who want to go, it's my turn. I'd like to be of service. And we're looking for people to serve on your council. So we'll be looking for a new vice president. And that person needs to uh, be ready to learn president of, of Greg, presidentship of, uh, it will, no, of, of Janet will be our new president. And then uh, she, that person will become the president. And then we're also looking for an at-large member. Probably we'll need a secretary, as our secretary has found employment in another county. But uh, do pray and think on this. It's the first Sunday of October. And so we'll probably want all those names uh, by the first Sunday of December. Would that be right, Jan? So we can get them in the annual report? Terrific. I won't take much more of your time. You can present those ideas as names or say, I'd like to do this this time to me. Uh, other people are Victoria Hansen, she's on the committee, Steve Lenz, and Karna Stott. So please pray and think about this, and maybe there's somebody that's not here, and you can go, you know, this would be a good fit for you. So please pray on this, and service is the highest calling. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 18 to 24. And this can be found in the Old Testament on page 2. The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And God caused a deep sleep to come upon him. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of the, the man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. Mark, reading in the 10th chapter. 
some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to him, to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter into it. And then he took up the children in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Before I begin, let me say just a couple of things. I'm really happy about today, in addition to Cindy's birthday <laughs> and having Holly with us. I'm really happy about the fact that this day, the 6th of October, is not the first day in the pulpit for our new pastor. There was a time when I thought she might, he or she might be able to be here by that point in time. And I'm just glad it's not this text. And the reason I'm glad it's not this text is that I have probably over the years preached on this text 20 plus, 25 plus times, and I've always offended someone. I've always hurt somebody's feelings. Usually people who have been married and divorced and may or may not have been remarried. But I think today about people who are involved in unions of the same sex. I think of people who choose not to marry at all. People who are widowed and then have to decide if I will marry again. It, it's just a tough part of church teaching. Some would say church law. Some would say church fumbling. Because I, at least, have always gotten this text wrong. And I apologize in advance to those of you who will be hurt by what I say. Dear friends in Christ, my wife's cousin Louise is an attorney. She is in a group with three other attorneys, and their firm is focused on family law, primarily divorce law. And they serve the western part of the cities and the western suburbs. And I asked her at a recent family gathering, is there enough for four of you to do? And she said, while the marriage rate has gone down a little bit, the divorce rate stays at about 45 or 50 percent. So, yes, there's more than enough for us to do. And then she went on to say, you know, divorce is so complicated. You have to think about medical insurance and property and life insurance and debt with a car or in a housing mortgage, 
You need to think about future tuition for the children if there are any. And you need to think about pension and how that could be divided up between the two that are no longer going to be one. Complicated business. But legal in these United States of America. Some Pharisees came. And it's not very often that a sermon can click in a pastor's mind by what the lectionary text left out. But that happened to me this week. What they left out was verse 1. And verse 1 is Jesus left the Galilee, entered into Judea on his way to Jerusalem, crossed the Jordan into Perea. Perea is the state led by one of King Herod's sons, Herod Antipas. And King Herod's son Antipas had gotten into the news recently by divorcing his wife, Eretas, and marrying his brother Philip's wife. Divorce is legal. He was within his rights to do so. But not in the eyes of John the baptizer. If you remember, John the baptizer went to King Herod And he scolded him for that act of divorcing his wife and marrying his brother's wife. And Herod showed his thanks for that kind of religious guidance by having John's head cut off. Remember that from about ten weeks ago? A lot at stake in how we understand divorce So here's Jesus in Perea and some Pharisees who, as you may recall, way back in chapter 3, verse 6, got together and colluded with the Herodians. The Herodians as a group were not very religious people, but they got together to figure out a way they could destroy Jesus. And so they come to test Jesus. And the test would be, One of two things. It would be, will you follow your cousin John the Baptizer's way and say that the marriage of Herod to Herodias Herodias was incorrect and immoral and wrong? And of course, if he did, his head could also be on a plate. The other thing that was at stake, maybe not as crucial is that at the time of Jesus, there were two main camps on the subject of divorce. One was a group of people called those of Shammai, and they believed that divorce could only happen if there had been unfaithfulness in one of the spouses. The group that followed Rabbi Hillel said, certainly if there has been unfaithfulness in one of the spouses, divorce is acceptable. But also, looking at the Hebrew words, if the man finds something uncomfortable, unpleasant, unnecessary in his wife, for instance, if she burns his supper, or if she's not as attractive as she used to be, or She's just not the kind of intellectual partner that I need anymore. I need something different. Or a new person in the office has shown some interest in me, and I must admit I'm interested in her. For any of those reasons, a man could divorce his wife. And it was the man who took this action because women were not allowed to divorce their husbands. So Jesus says, he asked this question, and I've given you a very brief two to three minute insight into why this is complicated in their society. And, and, and he says, you know what, you, you get this because Moses understood your condition and your condition was due to the hardness of your heart. Sclerocardia 
in Greek. I believe there's an English term that doctors use when talking about arteries that are filling up. Hardness of heart. That's why Moses gave this command to you, because of your hardness of heart. He could have stopped there. Divorce was legal, had been for centuries in Palestine. But he pressed on. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And with apologies to people, no people who are in same-sex unions, same-sex marriages, I apologize. Jesus moves the discussion from Deuteronomy to Genesis, from Moses to God, from divorce to marriage. From that which is permitted to that which is intended. What is intended is that when people marry, and in our culture we have people of the sex marrying, we have people of opposite sex marrying, they are all legal and they are all blessed. When we have people marrying, What Jesus wants us to keep in mind, God blesses and effects that union, and that it is meant to be permanent. But not all marriages are permanent. I bet there's one or two or three people in this room who know somebody who's divorced. They don't always work out. Is Jesus establishing a new and even more impossible law to replace the impossible Mosaic law? I think that rather than establishing hopelessly high standards, Jesus is calling us to a purposely high vision. Keeping God's will. In marriage and in every way. That's the goal. And in marriage and in every way, we often fail. And when we fail, our only hope is and always has been Jesus, who took all of our failures and sins with Him to the cross. You know, it's interesting to go back and look at Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes and beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is very, very clear and actually tougher on his audience than were the scribes and the Pharisees and Moses himself in all of his discussions about anger and adultery and divorce and oaths and retaliation and enemies. Jesus leaves very little wiggle room to avoid... to avoid the consequences of our sins. But Jesus forgives them, forgives me, forgives us, forgives people who were married and then for whatever reason had to end that marriage, forgives them too. I want to say all of that two or three times more for those of you whom I've already offended. Jesus forgives all of our sins, even when we don't live up to the high standards that Jesus promulgates in this text from Mark 10. Let me give you an example. My cousin Donnie, he and his wife got divorced and... There were good reasons for the divorce. 
Donnie continued to attend his church, which welcomed people who were divorced, until they got married. So when Donnie and Clarice, his fiancée, went to the pastor of their congregation asking the pastor to preside at their wedding, he said, I can't do that. We don't preside at marriages of people who were divorced and then want to remarry. So they came to me, and I did their wedding, and it was beautiful, and their love was real. They were both divorced, and now they're both married. Thanks be to God. After their honeymoon, they went back to their church, and Don went to the choir locker room. This church was so big they had a locker room for choir members. And they had little places where you hung up your choir robe and your cross and your stole, just like NFL football players. (laughs) By the way, anybody keeping track of the game? (laughs) Don's locker and his name above it were gone. The locker was empty. Actually, there was another person in that locker. Meanwhile, Clarice went to the Sunday school wing where she had taught Sunday school for years and years and years. And when she arrived, her name wasn't above the door, listing her as teacher. There was another name. So she knocked and that teacher came out and and she said, Clarice, you've been replaced. They stayed in that church. I sure wouldn't have stayed in that church. We are still fighting over issues like this. So many of our churches. Which leads me to how Jesus concludes with welcoming children. It seems like this text has nothing to do with the one previous that has been so difficult and caused so much hurt this morning. It's a story of kids wanting to come to Jesus. And he says, come, jump on my back, run into my arms, get on my lap. Let me put my hands on you and bless you. I I need not remind you just a couple weeks ago, I told you that children in this society were of no count, no value. A father could choose to sell or kill a child in Roman law if he chose to. Not until they reached maturity and were able to help on the farm or the shop or whatever were they considered of importance at all. Now, I'm sure they were important to their mamas. And I think deep down inside, they were important to their daddies, but it didn't show up in public that way. There's only one way a child could come into the kingdom of God. And it's the way you came into the kingdom. By pure, unadulterated grace. And I got to tell you, if I'm there, And certainly some of the very fine divorced people that I know and love are there too. God loves you and so do I. We stand for the hymn.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to the needs. We give thanks for the church. May we listen for the prophets of this age who bear messages that stir the church toward greater renewal and justice. Hear us, O God. Creator God, direct our lives toward the renewal and sustaining of birds, animals of the field, and those who share our homes. Hear us, O God. Sovereign God, accompany us when hardness gets in the way of justice between people and nations. Hear us, O God. Restoring, Lord, work through medical professionals to diagnose, ease pain, and give hope to all who seek their wisdom and experience. Hear us, O God. We pray for those who are ill, recovering from surgery, and those receiving treatment and care, including Swede, Brooke, Cheryl, Micah, Arthur, Lindsay, Milo, Jackie, and others whom we name either out loud or silently at this time. Bronwyn. Hear us, O God. Lord of the Church, bless the members of the Messiah Call Committee who will today present to our membership the person they are recommending to serve as our next settled pastor. Hear us, O God. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you Always. Please share that peace among yourselves.
I was thinking this morning when I was listening to the band rehearse, I'm sure going to miss listening to this band. (laughs) They are really very, very good. Messiah should be proud and grateful, and I know that you are. Today I want to lift up all of them, but especially Mike with that, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 bar lead guitar piece. Can we thank Mike and the whole band? Please stand for the offering prayer. Merciful God, receive the offering of our lives that following in the way of the cross, we may know the joy of the resurrection. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you, and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. So a couple notes about communion. We're going to do two today. So make sure you notice that, that kind of a movement. We have gluten-free bread. We have regular bread. We have white grape juice. We have red wine. We have everything that you need. I sure hope you will come. You can let the ushers direct you to come forward. In the meantime, you may be seated.
Please stand for the communion blessing. And now may the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I thought today was about as good as it gets. (laughs) I hope that you felt that way. Even if you didn't, there are people out there in your lives who would benefit from being part of a service like this. Invite them. Come with them. Ask them to come. Who knows? They might say yes. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with God's favor and give you God's peace. Amen. In peace to love and serve the Lord. And you, and you may be seated. Thank you, Holly. You are terrific as always. Appreciate it. Well, You've been waiting for this, I'm sure. Um, You can tell this is a special day. Two reasons. One, I'm wearing long pants. But more importantly than that, I'm wearing socks. (laughs) That I got in the Do we have uh, the agendas? Okay. Agendas are being passed out. And I better get one.
The purpose of this meeting is to call uh, a pastor, send a letter of call to Pastor LaDonna Thomas. And I, as president of this congregation, having had all the proper notifications sent out in the proper time frame, calling this meeting to order. Thank you. Pastor Tim, would you lead us in a prayer, please? The Lord be with you. We ask nothing more that you would be with us in our fellowship of being in a pretty full church under the leadership of a great church council and terrific president and being inspired by the work of a dedicated and giving call committee. We do nothing more than just simply ask for your presence to guide our proceedings and to help us to know and to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.